We are already uh, 3.32, so welcome everyone. Uh, today, myself and Sultan will be the host of this session, focus on customer experience in the time of COVID-19 and the pandemic. Um, I see Sultan is already sharing his screen. I will also have a presentation, um, which I will start with. Yes. Well, yeah, so go ahead. I believe you can see myself now and the presentation. Yes, and if you click on that, you can make the screen bigger uh, for yourself so the entire uh, presentation will be better visible for you, unless you want to, of course, keep an eye on us as the speakers as well. So Welcome, my name is Yulita Davies. I'm responsible for digital and marketing strategy for Cobelco here in the Netherlands. Uh, in Almere, we have our European headquarters. And as you can see on my very first slide, which is pretty much self-explanatory, we are Japanese producer of heavy machinery, construction machinery, earth moving, uh, demolition machines and dismantling machines. And as I mentioned, we are a Japanese company, headquartered in Tokyo, and production is mainly in Hiroshima. We have a very long tradition. The very first Kobelko you can see here, that's a shovel, electric shovel machine that was designed and introduced for the very first time to the market back in 1930. And that was a very first electric um, mechanical shovel in Japan. Ever since Kobelko started building other machines, including cranes, dismantling and demolition machines. And since 2013, we are back in European market. Kobelko has two types of business that I look after. One of them is the B2B side, which is the main products that we sell. You can see this is our website showing the machinery that we have in our portfolio. We bring the machinery from Japan on the vessels here to the port of Amsterdam, and we distribute the machinery. We sell it via network of dealers. Those dealers are every single European country. And we have a business model quite similar to automotive companies. We do not have direct contact with our clients. We do not sell directly to construction companies or to the operators. We do it via the network of dealers. Mainly we choose uh, family businesses. And this is the strategy of Cobelco. But why we don't have a contact with the final client? Of course we do. We do it via social media and also via our B2C part. And for that, a couple of years ago, we decided to open Kobelko Fan Shop. And as you can see, this is the Kobelko Fan Shop website and some products that we are selling. This is mainly the apparel, workwear, gifts, and also very, very popular scale models. So this is what Kobelko does. We are manufacturer of heavy machinery from Japan. We distribute our products via the network of dealers and we also have the b2c side where we sell merchandise gifts and apparel directly to our audience directly to the drivers and all the fans of construction machinery we do it also via numerous of social media channels and both the websites and the social media are overseen by myself and today i want to tell you a little bit how the COVID-19 impacted us as a manufacturer, both on the B2B and B2B side. So let me give you a little perspective. Where we were before March 2020, how I see it, and I look at the business in general, the last two to three decades, we were focused on the manufacturers on optimizing our supply chain. The way manufacturers were having their profit 
were making their profit was to be extremely efficient and cutting the waste, becoming more lean. That meant that we heavily had to rely on supply chain to be working, just like a switch watch. And the trust in the fact that we can at any point get the spare parts was very important for running that business smoothly. Perhaps we could have foreseen that something might disturb that perfect system. But optimization that we were looking forward to, the main objective to be lean, made us optimize the cost and stop warehousing, made us rely on constant supply of parts and components. Have we prepared for a disaster? Did we took the necessary steps to overcome it? Shall it happen? Well, let's, let's look at the poll. As we can see, some of you provided us with answers regarding your business. And we can clearly see that some companies says, yes, we were very well prepared. Some were only prepared to a certain extent. And there were also those, and that's a 28% of them, they were not prepared at all. So the disaster happened. For the very first time, we are in the situation that not one industry, but actually every single industry is impacted by that situation. Not one region, but all the regions coming back fr coming from Asia to Europe, North and South um, America, and including Africa as well. Absolutely every industry, every country is impacted in one or other way by COVID-19. The major disturbance happens on absolutely every single market. So what's the future? The future is unknown and is difficult to predict. And it might be very different for each country. It might be very different for China, as it might be very different for European markets and America. So let's have a look and let's get a little bit of uh, perspective on what happened, actually. I like to think about Maslow hierarchy of needs because it gives us a perspective on how the customer experience was affected by COVID-19. And if you recall the Maslow hierarchy of needs, you can see that the two first basic elements that every human being needs is to ensure that his physiological needs are met and his feeling of safety, security is met. Only then all the other additional elements like love and belonging, esteem and self-actualization can happen. COVID-19 disturbed those two very basic elements of our pyramid of needs. For the first time we saw, even here in Western world, that people started queuing to get basic supplies, food, water, medications, even toilet paper. For the very first time, people started fearing about their safety, whether they will get a medical health. People did not feel safe and they did not feel that their basic psychological needs can be satisfied. How that impacted then the customer behaviors, big time. This is the Lloyd example of what is or what was the people's response to certain elements or certain activities. On the left hand side, you can see America, the US, and on the right hand side, I put Netherlands. You can see that there are two axes showing health and financial security. And you can see whether it's low or high. 
Also, you can zoom in to see how various countries are on that axis, with the Netherlands being all in green, while Mexico, India, China being all in red. Similarly to two countries that were very heavily affected in Europe, like Italy and Spain. This information was pulled from Deloitte back on 16 of May. So you might want to refer to it, how it's changed now. But I took those two to show the differences. This is the response from America, how people are concerned about their physical well-being or about the health of the family. Against the Netherlands, you can see a significant difference in those numbers and also significant difference in the trends, whether it goes up or down. You can also compare those numbers for different activities like the job security, going to the store, staying in the hotel and taking a flight. What does it mean? If the basic physiological needs of human beings are not satisfied, then the company has to ensure that it addresses those first two elements before it starts building on the next ones. And Kobelko, as I want to give you a little bit of case study, did exactly that. We were fully aware that bringing some kind of reassurance to the people is the most important thing. You can also recall probably yourself that your company sent emails to the customer and supplies on how you want to proceed in those difficult times. That reassurance was very important for the customers to understand how the company is doing, what steps is the company taking, and how it's going to be the business moving forward. We did it by publishing an update from Cobalco Europe website. We did it by informing our dealers about difficulties in supplying some countries. But at the same time, we said it is still business, not as usual, but definitely still in the game. And despite the difficult times, we decided to launch new machinery. We had a new machine coming and we thought in those challenging times, you also have to create opportunities for the business. You still have to be active. And we decided that we still want to launch the machine, albeit only digitally. We created a video of the machine arriving here to the Amsterdam and first time touching the ground on the European soil. We had a hashtag and quite a strong exposure via all digital channels we could. Similarly, when it came to B2C, we wanted to ensure everyone that while it might be difficulty in the place with the shipment, but we are still operating and that we take all safety precautions for the people that work with us to stay safe and healthy. At the beginning, we saw a massive drop in the interest only to regain it in April. And therefore, we still went ahead with numerous of promotions, like bringing back very much awaited scale models. And this is a print screen that you can probably all recognize as the Google Analytics. And despite the fact that we understood that in the time of Corona, people needs are shifting and they are not looking at luxury good. And we can imagine, you can imagine that Cobalco merchandise is not particularly the basic need people need to satisfy. Our numbers, when we look from January to May, year to year, seem to improve. The reason for that is that at first, in the month, month of March, the natural response of the clients was shock, insecurity, and shift towards those very first basic needs. And luxury products or products that are expensive or require more investment were not the priority. In April, despite everything, 
we launched a new product. And it turned out that while people were staying at home, they were much more willing to browse online. We brought a lot of traffic and we had also, surprisingly, huge conversion. I dive in the numbers and apart from basic goods that were sold and companies like Amazon or Albert, Albert Heim doubling in their online sales, we could also see that some businesses were really picking up. And there was Netflix, HBO, all the entertaining services. People were staying home and they had to be occupied. Sales of books increased. Sales of electronics increased because people were investing in electronics because they needed entertainment at home. Slowly, slowly, people started moving from satisfying their basic needs and staying at home into self-development and many people decided to pick up a new book or to take an online course. So after the initial state of insecurity and fighting for survival and safety, we adjusted to the situation and we started looking forward in investing in all the products and services that can help us survive the time at home. Definitely, pandemic had a huge impact on companies itself. And you can probably uh, see most of those points being also the case for yourself. Working from home, ensuring the safety in the workplace if people are still in the workplace, cut in business travels, no direct contact with clients or partners or very limited one, disturbance across the entire supply chain, and of course, sudden changes to business plans and budget. I have a question for you. How are your KPIs doing now? Charles Darwin said, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one that is the most adaptable to change. And this quote comes very often in various contexts, but I don't think there was ever a time that this quote was more up to date. Because if we don't manage to adapt to the change, we will probably perish as a business. I know Sultan will be referring to some companies that were game changers and they were for a decade absolutely fabulous superheroes like Uber, like Booking.com. And he will say, a few things more about them. How they will adapt. How is your business adapting to change? Will you be the strongest or you will be the most intelligent or the one that will be the most flexible and resilient? So we have a time, time frame here. And on the time frame, I put four elements. One of them is the prevention. Perhaps some of you did that very well, perhaps some not. We are now, as I believe, in the time of the response, somewhere in the middle, as we don't know how long the COVID-19 era will here, be here to stay. And there will be a moment of recovery that will start. And then the moment that we rebound. Question is, and you can see that big question mark on the side, how much that COVID-19 will have a lasting effect on the business. And that's again a question that we had here in the poll that we were asking how much it had an effect already and how many years you think it will take to recover and rebound. And I can see that there's quite a, um, number of answers, some people even saying, we will never recover. So the takeaways, we can only impact what we control. And that's the reason we should focus on four elements. The recovering of the revenue was probably what every company is looking uh, at, as the COVID had negative impact on the revenue. But it means that we have to start rebuilding operations. 
That means that we have to check, especially if you are a manufacturer, entire supply chain. And perhaps we need to add additional costs for warehousing or have different suppliers to minimize the risk and prepare show this kind of disaster would hit us again. Thirdly, we have to rethink the organization. You probably could have heard last week Facebook announcing majority of the staff working from home, and that's a situation to stay with many people being in the remote locations and not being directly in the office. And the next thing, accelerating the adoption of digital solutions. It proves that companies that had those digital solutions probably are doing better than those that have not took those steps. If there was a time to adopt digital solutions, the best time was yesterday. Absolutely must have now. And I'm leaving you with that, giving you a little bit of perspective on customer experience for the COVID-19. And Sultan will take it over. And we discuss it for a quite a um, long time and in depth over the last week. So he has some great content for you and fabulous examples. Sultan, over to you. Thank you, Yurita. Um, before I dive into, into this, the second part of the presentation, I was wondering if some people had questions uh, in the audience. Um, I see some people raise their hands. Sasha, Hans, or Dilo, and Joe. Let me just see if I can see those people. Did you have any questions? Probably not. Okay. Well. So let me just share my screen and then we can kick off. So application window. Yeah. Okay, I think you should be able to see my, my presentation. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sultan Simnali. I'm a sales development director for Oracle CX, so the customer experience part of Oracle. Um, I love customer experience and I love flying in a lot of things. Um, and these are some strange times, um, but these are some very interesting times. Um, and it's really cool to uh, thing actually about what disruption was two years ago when or three or four or five years ago when Uber, Facebook, Alibaba, Airbnb and all those companies were what we call disruption. Um, we come now with a virus that we don't see, that we can't feel and uh, that's a real disruption. So I think as soon as it touches health, uh, we see where uh, disruption really lies. Uh, I, I wanted to start with a, with a small story about, uh, I lived um, back in the days, not back in the days, but in 2010, end of 2010, I moved with my girlfriend then uh, to live in the Caribbean on the beautiful island of St. Martin. It's beautiful, it's Caribbean and so on. And uh, we lived there for a year, we loved it. And when you live somewhere, you kind of leave a piece of yourself there. Um, and in 2017, uh, there was a hurricane coming up. So every year we are in hurricane season. Hurricane season will be beginning again soon. And it goes from the Atlantic all across the Caribbean up to the US. And Hurricane Irma was, um, it looked big, but we thought, okay, it's gonna be okay. It's category three on a scale of number five. Uh, but then it started growing, growing, growing. And um, to give you a perspective on how a hurricane looks like, uh, if that hurricane went over Europe, this is the size it would have. Um, knowing that you have some winds in the red part that are about 280 kilometer per hour, um, there's a huge path of destruction going there. 
and this is just some example of, of damages. That's a hotel um, that I went once for lunch, and it was a before and after picture. So what is really interesting about this hurricane and made me think about it is that um, we see hurricanes coming, uh, like we saw uh, COVID happening in China. We thought, oh, it's okay, it's far. And then it gets near, and then you need to think about preparing yourself. And then when it's really close by, then everybody runs to the supermarket and try to get some water, some toilet paper and whatever, and try to be ready for it. And when it's there, it comes and it has a huge impact. Uh, I have some friends still living there. I have friends that moved to the Netherlands after the hurricane. Um, these people have been in shock and I still need to process it almost three years ago now. And, and the key thing is that um, it's not necessarily the hurricane itself. So you have the hurricane, the storm comes in, the eye of the storms, it's getting quieter a bit where we are now, I'm afraid. Uh, then you might have second wave coming in, but the, the biggest damage comes after that. So it's usually good practice when you live there to have a supply of water and food and so on. And people did not have that. They were not prepared enough because uh, they did not expect it or because they didn't have the money to buy so much food for two or three weeks. And so some for the time, for the help to come there, it took, it actually the help arrived three days after the hurricane, but before they were able to land and distribute and everything, it took almost two weeks for people to get food and, and water. So, um, and people are still rebuilding the island. So we are two and a half year after, and we're still rebuilding. And I'm kind of concerned about um, on one side, whether we are ready to go and go further, or if it will take a long time. In all ways, I think it is key for us to keep on investing and on looking at the best way to move forward and be ready whenever things happen. Uh, I'm fortunate to work for a company called Oracle. Uh, Oracle is a 40-year-old startup um, where our mission is to help people see data in new ways, uh, discover insights and unlock and less possibilities. So, uh, we are a database company, we love data, uh, we live through data and uh, really want to help customers get more out of the data. So we don't have too little data, we have too much data, we need to be able to be smart about it. And today we live in an experience economy where um, it's really key that the experience we provide to customers and to our employees is really what defines the value of whatever we have. Customers want to innovate with your product and they see um, the relationship they have with you as non-linear. So we can define a funnel, we can define a customer journey. Customers will not abide by those rules. They will go wherever they want to go and they will interact the way they want to. So there's a lot of actually power that we need to let go of. And if we look across those industries, um, COVID has a huge impact across multiple industries. Um, and some industries are doing well, like online-only business, and transport and travel on the other side of the scope has been struggling and suffering. And so there are a lot of risk currently, uncertainty, but at the same time, there is some growth potential for uh, multiple uh, industries. So we have been put now not only into using Zoom and working remotely, but really uh, companies need to go into faster speed of transformation uh, and being able to adapt way quicker. And we see actually that that curve, that's a study coming from IDC that I'm more than happy to share after this, um, where they really looked at um, how do organi organizations work now. So what we are now, we went through a slowdown where the focus has been on ROI. We see that organizations have been uh, stopping temporary contracts. Uh, some people have been fired. If you look at the US, it's, it's a dramatic situation there. Um, and companies are really looking at, okay, so how can we save money? Um, and then you come within a recession stage where you need to get some operational resiliency. So how do you make sure that the operations and that you are still able to provide services to your customers that are highly in demand? And 
uh, rebuild towards recovery. Um, so we see all those, uh, a lot of restaurants now have started to uh, do uh, pickup orders. Um, and many of them started that because of COVID and will keep doing it because they saw it as a good way actually to keep the business afloat and get new customers. And if you look at the really trends and, and where we believe that the innovation will take place is really around all those areas we have been touching and working with around data, AI, uh, next generation logistics, uh, API first economy, uh, defining new business model, platforms, blockchains. Uh, we see actually that all the small innovations that were somewhere in organizations will start popping up and really being leveraged uh, at a higher scale. So how as a business uh, should I deal from a marketing stand of point? Um, I think a lot of people on, on, on the call today are familiar with the concept of share of voice. Um, share of voice is really the measure of the market and how many people are speaking about you compared to your competitors. And it's really good to give a, a gauge for your brand visibility and how much people are talking about uh, you um, compared to your competition. And usually to, to get a share of voice, you would advertise, uh, you try to, to get some more um, contact with customers. And we truly believe that uh, organization that will dare now will win big in the end. Uh, so we saw this ROI in the curve, focus on ROI. Uh, company accountants are currently cutting marketing budgets, um, but actually investing in marketing, investing in everything that has to do with your customer will probably have a high return. And it's not something that we think, it's something that has been shown also across history. So you had a crisis in the 20s, um, the gas crisis 74, 75, and in the 90s. Uh, every organization that increased their advertising during those years, starting outperforming actually their competitors. So companies have stopped advertising, they wanted to save money, actually starting actually to lose way more. And that's, uh, played over and over again. And, and one of the most recent cases is what Virgin Atlantic has been doing. So Virgin Atlantic, uh, in 2008, we had the last financial crisis. Um, and what they decided to do was counterintuitive. They said, okay, well, we'll increase our marketing budget by 10%. The competition cut their spends and um, they had a payback of 11 to one um, thanks of the extra share of voice versus their competition. I think this is really a key, a key example and probably a good example to share uh, with our organizations um, to really show that uh, now is the time to invest and now is the time to, to do things. Um, and it touches only the acquisition, but probably the, um, key thing is that not only we need to look at acquisition, but we also need to look at retention. So how do we re retain customer? Uh, we all know that it's way more expensive to acquire new customer than to maintain an existing one. And um, when you increase retention, you have also a very positive effect on your profits. Um, so if you're able to have a balanced approach to that, there is some big growth uh, to be achieved. And it's even more important because we are now in what we call a B2Me, uh, where it's not a matter anymore of talking to business to business or business to consumer, but it's really about uh, speaking to individuals. Um, what COVID will have, I think, as an extra impact is that we are spending even more time uh, using B2C-like services. Um, and this kind of experience is really what individual people buy from people uh, will be looking to buy. So this is really where we need to um, to help our organization. And we see actually three key assets where you can win the customer hearts and businesses. It's about empathy, uh, really understanding where your customers are coming from, um, where we see simple initiatives like um, just 
doing some some check-ins uh, with your customers. So some brands doing that, just reaching out proactively and seeing how how things are going. Um, investing in digital, make it as much as possible the the best convenient um, experience. And finally, act responsibly. So really try to contribute to society and make sure that you put people first before profit. And because of all those changes, what we see is that the most convenient platform will win. Uh, we have a lot of different tools to communicate, to give as, as an example, and we see actually that the, the platforms that are winning are the ones that provide the best experience, where our friends are using, find it easy, and this is really the things that we will be using. And if you don't provide a great experience to your customer, you don't allow them to be uh, self-sufficient and to work easily, um, it, it's going to make it, uh, you can expect to lose sales. Uh, so, if you look at what customers want, and even more now, is that, uh, first of all, they don't want to see your organization chart. They don't want to talk to marketing, to sales, to service. Uh, they want to help, be helped immediately. They want an immediate resolution. And whenever they reach out to an organization, they want actually to get an answer very quickly. They want to achieve collaborative success. They want to be successful themselves, but also together with you. And if you are able to provide that, you will really have a fantastic brand experience. And customers will also want to be understood at any point within the journey. And, and that's, that's a tough thing, especially when you have people working from home uh, remotely and not being able to, to see each other face to face. So what we think is that we really need to reimagine the role of customer experience by focusing on essential capabilities uh, where marketing sales service even though there are different kinds of sports um, the basis behind it needs to be the same we need to be able to have a marketing that is not about campaigning and pushing things uh, we need to have a sales where it's about working together with your customers and being smart about it and allowing them to uh, do a lot of things themselves if they want to. And on the service side, it's really about being proactive and um, providing proactive service, so before people even ask for it, or to leverage intelligent services like bots or super agents um, to provide a better service. So one of the customers we've been working with uh, recently, I think two months ago, uh, when the lockdown began, is a electronics company in the UK. Um, and they have customers, and they have mostly focused on elderly customers that have devices from them. Um, with the crisis, the people still have issues with devices. Sometimes they need replacement, and they need it still to provide that service to people. Um, before being able to send safely your employees to a customer, um, they decided to say, okay, we need to understand what the situation is at the customer's side, but we also want to interview the customer to make sure that those people are not sick, uh, that ourselves are not sick, we're not making other people sick. Um, so what I did is they um, asked us to help them scale actually all those requests. And what we did with them is building some smart questionnaires uh, written by their business that would be available through chatbots, through um, uh, online um, form like Wizard, uh, but also through phone, that when people reach out and they say, okay, I need a replacement for my uh, television or whatever, um, they can go very quickly through a questionnaire that can actually say, well, you don't have... Uh, fever, um, you're located there, um, this is a problem you have, and very quickly by connecting all those dots, information from the customer that they give you, and information out of this system, what kind of products do these customers have, they were able actually to keep the same level of service level agreement to their customers, being able to help them, even though uh, there was a rising number of cases and a um, lower number actually of people being able to support. 
So if we look at the way to deliver success in the new normal, we believe that you first need to focus on the business to me, really about focusing on the time, providing actually customer the information as fast as possible at the moment they want. It's around them and it's taking care of their emotions because this is really the basis of the experience economy. And in order to do that the best, you need to have clear data strategy. What kind of data do I need? Um, how do I bring it together? Um, which data is relevant and not necessary for me? Um, embracing AI and innovation uh, by using new business models, uh, using AI, all the things that you have been doing, how can you embrace them and leverage them? Um, leverage content of all kinds. We are new in a new form of contract with this hope in session now, uh, but also all content that you can produce and make available for your customers through YouTube or any other means. Um, being able to hyper-personalize, provide actually what is really requested by the customer. Um, align your technology around your customer by putting all those data points that you might have. So in the case of Cabalco, it might be actually the information coming out of a machine uh, using IoT data. Uh, in the case of other services, it's really about collecting all those data points and try to be uh, more, uh, provide a stronger experience to your customer. And have also the organization that is willing to work like this. Um, so if you look at those six areas, uh, we see six CX priorities, and uh, we are working together with brands on how can we help them actually increase this maturity. Uh, to do that, we have started an initiative, which is called the Business Resiliency Workshop, um, which is actually a free of charge uh, workshop that we do for a select number of customers and that we really want also to promote today uh, for attendees of this session, where I really want to look with you at um, what is the shock for your organization, but also what is the opportunity and how can you um, reorganize, replan uh, and try to get some quick wins out of this crisis. And it's really pretty straightforward format where we'll look at, okay, how can we help you maximize business resilience after the lockdown uh, by the means of two workshop of two hours that take place remotely and that uh, we can take together. So I really want to thank you. Um, it's kind of a abrupt end. <laughs> Thank you, Sultan. I remember how you, we were talking uh, weeks before this event about mm -hmm. what's now, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And of course, me coming from manufacturing and you from more service oriented, uh, the word agile came. And yeah. I gave it a lot of thought because I believe, of course, to a certain extent, companies might want to be more agile now. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, in manufacturing, not everything can be agile, but definitely marketing and sales approach or customer service can be agile. So what is your take on, on that? Uh, yeah, it, it is. Agile is kind of an overused word, <clears throat> but, it, but it really makes sense. Um, think enough to try to small, to work in small increments and getting some small products that we can, and it can be anything. Um, and it's kind of counterintuitive also for large organization like ours, where we're usually from those long process and long things, and where we see that we need to be more agile and more nimble. Um, but I would be very interested to, to hear the opinion of people on the call. Um, how do they see um, agile for themselves? Um, I don't know if I can see some people. I think you can raise your hand somewhere and then we can... Uh, Add you to the you. conversation. Yeah, yes. If anyone has any story to share with us to make it more 
Okay. Rachel is bringing, jumping in. Yeah, besides that question, I probably also wonder if we have also in the room some people that are uh, some COVID optimistics. Uh, we, di we did have, I don't know if that's a correct word, but I um, also saw some people that are expecting things to go back quickly to normal of to think that some of the impact on customer experience will not be lasting after, yeah, after COVID-19. Yeah, we're looking at that right now. It's uh, seven votes in total for people that thought within three to six months yeah. we can be back. Of course, I can imagine that it might differ per country and industry, um, especially that that's what you, we can see in the polls. Some people said that they have actually a positive experience um, mm -hmm. of the pandemic. There are some businesses that thrive or, or really were made for a situation like this. So perhaps someone who is positive and uh, about the the outcome of this COVID nineteen and someone who is from the business that actually benefited from the situation would like to share their story. Yeah. You can raise your hand and we can add you to the conversation. Yeah, look, Dilo and Joe. During lockdown to create a ventilator line for hospitals. That's a good example. Yeah, I think yeah. We've been using the resources that you have, indeed. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the key with Agile in this case is also because you allow the team to be creative and have a say on what they are doing. It's not top down. Um, it is for everyone to, to agree on strategy, test, um, and come up with ideas. So that's also the change in, in the all silos kind of type of organizations and more agile teams, mm. where the, the team manages itself so people can be more creative or innovative. Yeah, yeah but it, it, it's a big mindset change. So you need to leave the command and control kind of organization to really allow people to do that. Um, let me see, Martin. Um, he said he doesn't have uh, the yeah, sure. video. You can you can pop any question you have in the yeah. chat. Yeah. Hans, Hans is saying some companies were forced to become agile. Um, I can understand that totally, right? But there's an idea. Let's go agile, and, and uh, but if you would tell us um, an example, or why do you think? or do you have any experience on that? Please do share. Please ah, do he's on his way. He's on his way. He just stepped in his car and he's uh, driving to us. All right. <laughs> All right. And in the meantime, if any one of you has a good story and would like to share, we do want to give you oh. the vote and let us know also what's your take on that and what's your experience. Share Ambi is not working with me. Yeah, Rachel, can you help? Agile for me is to as often and as fast as possible meet clients and his needs. That comes from Igor. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that that is what Sultan you were saying to respond to customer needs to be room focused, also asking the right questions. What data do you need? What data you don't yeah. need? What kind of uh, conclusions you can get from that data? So um, definitely, client needs can be better assessed once we when once we have that data. PT Hans mm -hmm. cannot join us. I see he has a problem. Yeah. Martin. 
I think a lot of companies realize they weren't agile at all. I believe large factor is them having extremely outdated KPI practices in place. That's true. That's true. Martin, would you like to join us? Jump in. Yeah, he can't. So he said earlier that he cannot oh, have yeah. access to audio video. Yeah. 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 Which well, is a pity. think about your KPIs and how they look now, right? Uh, how many companies have to rethink their budget and their strategy, et cetera, et cetera. So, Hans. Yeah. But I experienced in a healthcare organization that they were forced to switch to video meetings instead of personal meetings. Absolutely. I think there are some businesses that you have to have a personal meeting and healthcare is one of those. Um, yeah. That's for sure. That's for sure. Um, that's true. Anyone else? So, so what, what, what kind of impact on, on a KPI perspective for you, Yulita? So did you have any um, KPIs that have been changed for you or not yet or how? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, this is the last thing I was thinking of actually, uh, because the KPIs has to be a result of what we are doing, but they are not the goal itself. Uh, if you think your, your goal is your KPI, then your motivation is wrong because your motivation like an agile should be always quality. And if you do quality job, your KPI should be met, right? So that would be that way. Mm -hmm. But one thing that is part of our KPI and a big part of the budget and strategy is the physical events that we do, the trade show, when we can show the machinery, right? We have physical product that we want to show. And Again, personal story, I left to US for a major uh, exhibition on 8th of March, and we already knew that the situation was bad, but I came on 13th of March, and 15th of March, America was shut down. There were no more connections. And the event was even shorter than Vegas. And since then, all the events we had plans, and we had quite a few, been first postponed to the second half of the year, and now they are coming. Mm -hmm which means that our physical launch of the of the uh, machine will not happen and everything has to go digital. So yeah. it's a complete shift of making the business. You can imagine probably car manufacturers uh, have in a similar way. You launch the model, you show, you have people, you have trade shows like Geneva. That is not going to happen. Everything will be uh, online. And we, you, you have to find a new way of presenting car or machinery that child mm -hmm. how about you um not yet as such um we did indeed have those switch towards uh, digital the uh, digital events webinars and so on so um we were planning to have our big fair end of march in chicago that also was cancelled i think a month before because we we're seeing the uh, COVID crisis uh, coming up um uh, but still, I, I think we'll see that our new fiscal year starts next week. So I think we'll we'll see that there. Uh, but we see at least that we have had a huge focus shift um, towards customer success instead of towards generating revenue. Um, so really embracing that idea that actually customer retention and customer success has more impact in the long term. And so it's the right thing you need to be looking at. Well, I think Cobalco has some values and the uh, very first thing that we have is the safety, purely because we are a manufacturer. So it means safety for our own people working on assembly machinery. And secondly, mm -hmm. safety for all the operators, people that are in contact with the machinery. It's very dangerous. Uh, construction is a very dangerous business. So we have to ensure that our machines are not only powerful and efficient, but they are safe. Uh, safe yeah. working long hours. So safety was always a key factor. That's why when we moved to working at home, it was natural that the company is living by its value. You know, nobody will put uh, be put in any danger. You don't need to come to the office. And if you are a field personal like service, 
you need to really have a reason to go there. And if you go there, ensure you are safe. So that was the first thing. And second part is quality. For us, quality is coming first. So if it means that we have to pay extra for something, we will take that cost to deliver that quality to customer because customer is the third element that we want customer satisfaction. And price is only fourth element of the whole puzzle. So we had, I believe, as a Cobelco, the priorities right. And in a situation like this, even looking at the Maslow, as I said, right, we look at the safety, which is the first one, the, the, the needs of the customer, which is very important, of course, the, the quality, and the last one is the price. Price, price is the luxury, right? Price yeah. is the luxury. You can have a high price product or low price product, but that's a luxury thing where you are. But safety and quality is something that has to be in that product. Yeah. Indeed. And maybe the, the the word might not be price, but might be more value, probably, um, the way you would look at it. So and more towards the perception of value for, for the customers and, and how do they see it. Um, so question from Martin. Um, correctly, <laughs> like, like it. Implementing many of the things discussed today will take a lot of time for companies, especially those who have become complacent while relying on success in recent years. Especially true for companies without a clear vision on retrieving actionable insight out of their data. This is often long-term transformation. What have been your experiences with this? Um, if, if I look at, at the way we engage on, on data transformation project, these are indeed uh, long-term uh, processes. Um, but um, the last conversations we have with customers over the last couple of weeks uh, in the Netherlands, as an example, is that those big um, transformation projects that we're having are being cut down into smaller chunks where organizations want to have a quicker path to success. So mm -hmm. instead of having an implementation process that will be like six months, uh, companies look, okay, so how can we deliver within two to three weeks as an MVP um, that will be actually measured over time? So we're really falling within a, a more short-term kind of delivery, very agile, uh, but at the same time, um, we see that there is still a commitment uh, at executive level within our organization. I think this is really key. Um, so the long term is being carried by executive level, um, but we need to provide them some quick wins and show them actually that mm -hmm. um, they get something out of it and not just a PowerPoint presentation after three months. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your questions, uh, Martin. But I have a question because you and your presentation specifically says that the data the, that's not that the customer journey it's not linear that we cannot do any funnels etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So how do prediction works then? Especially in the situation that we had probably some kind of trends over last years. Now we have a crisis that might completely change entire uh, data set. So yeah. what did you experience if you look at the data in general? Oh. Data in general, that's a good one. <laughs> I, I, I read a very interesting piece about the algorithm for Amazon, um, mm -hmm. where um, the demand for a smartphone crashed and was replaced by, um, yeah, screens, uh, laptop screens, or how do you call this, a desktop uh, mm -hmm. screens, um, and toilet paper. And the engines that were used, actually, uh, those AI engine and machine learning uh, algorithm were not able, actually, to cope with those uh, changes in behavior. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think I agree that um, we need to um, have data sets that are able to learn very quickly. So the example of what we have done with some organizations into um, there was this bank in Egypt, uh, I forgot the name, um, but they also had some guarantee around um, mortgages, uh, also uh, salary protection and a number of things that people could ask for at the bank. Um, so what we did is within a couple of days, we were able actually to build a new data model and a new um, logic and train the AI actually to get them to be able to answer those specific questions. Um, 
So I think technology allows us now to do that very quickly uh, mm -hmm. within a matter of hours. Uh, we also did that in the UK for uh, NHS, uh, where they needed to have uh, questions and um, kind of about where people could go with their symptoms. Um, so there are things that we have been working on where the engine can be trained very quickly, but you might need to start from scratch. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, Martin. Yes, thanks. I'm assuming there's a dual strategy at work in those scenario when I focus on short-term results and look at MVPs and not on sustainable. And yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I, I see also one of the um, also one of the topics that are being talked by organizations and starting now is around the consolidation of technology and how can you uh, consolidate your uh, marketing stack or your data stack or whatever, and how can you do that actually in a, in a, in a cheaper way? Um, so uh, at least in technology, we know that we are used to talk with people from the business and from IT, and I expect uh, in the coming month now to have more and more the CFO stepping into those conversations on how can we make the organization more lean and, and save money on all those things and get a better TCO and a better ROI from the investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the IT investments are always long-term investments and they are always yeah. building one another. It's not one investment and, and that it's done because the technology mm -hmm. progresses all the time. So um, Victoria also gives you all a tip how to raise your hand. You have to press ask to share all your button so if any yeah. one of you would like to take part in the conversation or step into the uh, stage then you are more than welcome we would love to hear from you yeah. otherwise you can ask your questions in the chat box Sultan, but uh, your presentation, I love the, the, the your stories. So you said also, uh, you mentioned also convenience. And uh, at one of the events, uh, I remember there was a quote, convenience is the new loyalty. Yeah. You said, what's convenient will win. And we can see that over the years, businesses or platforms that offer convenience, like ordering food online, sharing an apartment, et cetera, et cetera, won the heart of the, 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 the or, uh, audience. Yeah. So what is the convenience now in the COVID era for the businesses? Um, what are the, that you think that will be the winning for, for, the customer, for the customers? It might be a bit broad, but I think it's everything that has to do with making sure that um, you are providing customers with what they want in the way they want. Um, at the time they want. So, um, and it's an interesting one because we, we used to say that uh, marketing is sending the right message at the right time to the right customer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and now it's going towards uh, providing the answer um, at, at the right time, at the time that the customer is actually expecting it. So the balance of power uh, and that convenience thing is really actually where the change happens. So I, I think we really need to uh, more than ever, think that uh, customers are the new bosses, and that is fine. That's true. And I, yeah, and I think Martin also uh, redefinition of marketing as a field as well. Yeah, that's true. I think marketing is not. Um, I studied marketing myself, and um, back in the days when I had hair and I was a hippie, um, it was like the party planner and advertising, and we see that. Um, yeah, it's all about a customer. So how, how do you see, yeah, data how, data as well. Yeah, how, how do you how do you work on convenience uh, or Cobelco? So, um, I, I, are you looking into that? Is that something that is part of the design of your machines, or I mean, it's very um, specific. I think we have to distinguish between the, 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 the machinery and and the the, the, the merchandise or the, the, the fan shop. Uh, yeah. Of course, in the fan shop, it's e-commerce, so it's easier to serve the right message. Yeah. We have a mailing list. We know the behavior of customers. We know what product they want. And that's why we were successful last month, because yeah. we knew 
that if we release a product that was really people were waiting for, we can still have our revenue, etc., because people are still visiting us and willing to buy. Now, when it comes to machinery, different um, convenience, definitely an IoT solution. So. Uh, availability to use your mobile phone to, for example, see manage your entire fleet. So all the solutions that are uh, GPS focus and uh, if you have quite a few machines, you can see where they are, how many hours they were working, in what kind of mode, how much petrol you used. Uh, yeah. Because you can imagine that those machines, um, they are quite expensive petrol-wise. Um, okay. Kobelco, you know, we, we are proud to say we save you fuel. So mm -hmm. being able to have a real-time insight into data uh, is very important. But that means also we as a company, we have an access to that data. So we can see now, for example, when we do predictions for our business in uh, H2, how many machines are working? And there was a moment of drop, March, April, when we saw machines not working. So we knew that the, the customers are not building anything. Yeah. So if there is no construction going on, there will be no need for new machinery, right? Because yeah. the construction business is very fragile. Uh, the, the good point was the petrol went down. So it also affected it in positive way in this case. Mm -hmm. But then we started looking data and seeing that countries are picking up that Italy Spain UK big markets for us they picked up the construction is going on uh, we don't know how many projects were stopped and we certain drop in certain countries of the uh, new orders uh, but we can at least estimate how much work those machines are um, doing and keep in mind for machinery like this downtime or no work time is cost so we definitely use that data and that for anyone who is a customer of Kobelco, the convenience is that they can manage that fleet from their mobile phone in real time um, and ha they have an access to it and they have access to historical data. And we can also see trends or behaviors in the real time. So yeah. that's, that's the convenience for us when the technology comes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a very interesting point. COVID, the customer service operation. Um, yes, definitely. Uh, when it comes to the customer service, of course, we have the online team that supports the clients. Uh, we have, of course, the spare, part business, spare parts business that is very important because spare parts has to be delivered because, again, as I said, downtime costs money. Um, we have our own warehouse here, so we manage to mitigate the risk. But, of course, our supply chain of spare parts and components was disturbed. Uh, so definitely that was the impact. And the biggest impact was that our field uh, engineers could not reach the machine if they needed to be maintained or repaired. Because in many countries, you could not travel unless you had a valid reason. Uh, and of course, you could not be in any contact with the, the customer. Uh, some countries were more strict than the others, but we, you can think of Germany, France, UK, and Italy and Spain as big markets. Those markets were heavily impacted. So there was a freeze moment. Um, and we had to follow the regulation of each country on how we can behave, who can move, et cetera, et cetera, and take the safety measures absolutely for our own uh, staff and our clients. So it did affect us, but the online part, mm, luckily not so much. The workers are at home, the employees uh, having an access to the computer, the database, the telephone, so they can provide still that service. But everything that required field, Activity was impacted, indeed. Yes, yeah. slowly, slowly, we are getting back to what is the normal. Yeah, taking all the precautions. And what about people here in the um, in the room? Do did you get? Where did you see the biggest impact on on your business uh, organization standpoint? Is that on the customer service? Is that on sales, on marketing, on production? Um, it will be interesting to know where the impact was for you. It can be posted via the chat. Or you can press ask to share audio and video button uh, to request. <laughs> we would love to have someone with us here. 
on internal business processes. Oh, that's interesting. Right. <laughs> that is a good one. I think we have someone joining us, uh, or at least Mark Grant. Mark. Hello, Mark. Hello. I felt bad that no one was uh, sharing their screen. Um, <laughs> it, I just wanted to answer in terms of business impact for for my company. So I work for. Can you tell it is and what kind of business so at least the audience is also aware of type of business you are in of course yeah so i work for elsevier we're a um well people might know us more as a publishing company but we're actually a, a data analytics and, and technology company so we've we've made the pivot in recent years from from published um to online to products digital products so with that has come you know, a, a whole different kind of customer experience in terms of supporting their problems with our digital products. Um, obviously, the business has been impacted in terms of shipping physical products, but uh, but more so in terms of how our agents are able to support our customers. So we haven't seen a massive decrease or increase in calls per se, because um, I think a lot of our customers are experiencing the same issues as we are. So say educational institutions, students, um, researchers, those kind of bodies, we've we've seen sort of there's there's been a little bit of impact. So, so maybe that's balanced um, with the increase in calls. But the problem we have had is with offices shutting down. So, for example, we have a lot of agents in the Philippines. So when the Manila office shut, we had people who were using desktop machines, uh, not necessarily um, yet. Well, quite a lot did not have laptops. So we really rapidly had to, to pivot and provide laptops, make sure we had that digital agent experience in order for them to, to help the customers. So um, as well as providing the hardware, luckily we were already set up to, to service remotely. So, um, you know, soft phones, um, we actually use Oracle Service Cloud, Oracle B2C. Um, <laughs> well, that might get a thumbs up. Um, so, so we're already set up. Um, it was the physical hardware we needed in order to do that so yeah talking on on purely the customer service aspect that was probably our biggest challenge right so digital tools having the tools available for people was a key thing yeah definitely and and then um you talked a little bit about kpis earlier and um the fact that yeah if if you're trying to work to hit KPIs, then, you know, you're kind of missing the point. They're there to support the measurement. But what you're really trying to drive is behaviors. And, um, and you know, I, I think we're getting there. We're, we're on a journey to that. And, and we were even before COVID hit. Um, but, you know, being able to be there for our customers and, and support them through this time. Um, we've also, as a, as a company, released all of, all of our research data that we have on on covid is all available free available free yeah. as well yeah. to for, for everyone to access so we've been able to pretty quickly um through some of the teams driving their own initiatives i'm talking outside customer service now um being able to mm -hmm. put up um a, a covid research hub that would allow people access we've we've set up um um the processes in order to to deal with those extra queries of people being able to access so um yeah again talking about helping people through this and and sort of we're all in it together kind of mindset we've we've been able to to do our little bit i think um and hopefully that's you know that's been well received as well that's a great thing i think if you show some solidarity and you give a helping hand for others and if everyone is releasing a little bit for free for everyone to kind of get the resources, especially resources on COVID or any any materials that you may possess, 
then you know we might all recover faster. It's like F1, Formula One supporting uh, the respiratory um, development, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think joining forces with people in this kind of time extremely important. So great to hear yeah. Octavia is doing that. Yeah, very yeah. nice. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, I'll drop back off. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Maybe, maybe you're the first to win and others will follow. We invite everyone yeah. to that experience. That is a great example. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's nice to yeah. hear. Yeah. yeah. Also, um, a little quickie comments here about some uh, managers being uh, allergic to working from home. Uh, yes, many of you would raise their hand to say, yeah, um, I know some people who are using working from home as a benefit, where well, now it's actually no other way. Sultan, how was it at Oracle? Did you have the policy for working from home or was it uncommon? No, it was common. Um, we, have, we have a lot of freedom on, on where we want to work and, and how. Uh, it's really about results. So you, you need to do your work and if you come into the office at nine o'clock or at 10 o'clock, it, it doesn't matter as long as you meet what you are expected to do. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think that the, the stress on, on work from home was, um, yeah, uh, coping with everything and trying to get some uh, time for the kids and the family and try to get those working hours, which you all have less, uh, uh, try to get them actually get as more as productive as you can be. So. Um, but yeah, and then you realize that you have kids and you realize how important school is for parents, <laughs> not necessarily yeah, for kids. Really people are actually more productive because you really start on time and you are not disturbed unless you have small children, of course. You do your things and then you are home actually right away after work. So you also can have some family time together. And don't forget, some people really travel a lot. Whether you are in London and you live in the suburbs, it might take you two hours yeah. to get get to the office um, sure. even here in Netherlands people do travel a lot there are some major yeah. hubs where people uh, work and they are the sleeping places around Amsterdam for example or Den Haag or Utrecht where people have to travel right and that takes a lot of time from your day and now being home you are actually probably more efficient I, I find that I'm, I'm really efficient and I have less disturbance mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so I enjoy that um, and and great to hear that this is a, a, a that it was a common practice for Oracle. I understand not for all businesses is possible, but uh, definitely. But what what about for you? Was that okay for you to work from home before that or not? No, we we had a freedom to take time if we necessarily needed for something. Um, the company was always open and very flexible and i think the trust within the team that you do your job anyway was there but we had the police uh, of being in the office between 9 and 5 30. Uh, yeah. and this is also because we are a quite traditional japanese uh, company yeah. and the japanese companies mean you are in the office you are present there etc etc um, <laughs> But, but w will it impact us uh, permanently? I don't know. We are now in process of discussing the, the safety uh, protocols in the office, uh, working in shifts, um, not m m making sure that people that travel with public transport have additional time to stay at home, accommodate mm -hmm. parents that have children, especially over the um, summer holiday period. So uh, the company is really trying to support us, uh, ensure the safety and healthy. This is a, a number one priority internally now. Yeah. I understand you are not um, able to travel either uh, right now. And... No, so, and um, we have kind of a, a ban on also on marketing activities until the end of the year, for example. So, um, unless having good reason. So, yeah, so we are really moving fully digitally. Um, I wonder if that's the same for all the people on the call. Um, <laughs> Tens being used as a KPI. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I can't help when you said a traditional Japanese company. Yeah, Yurita, I, I saw those. Um, 
this image of the Japanese guy going into the office in the morning with his black suitcase at eight o'clock in the morning, staying until 11, falling asleep behind his computer. So, um, but I was happy to hear you. For you, it was only nine to five, so it was okay. Yeah, but you have the experience too, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Well, you have to respect the company culture, right? That there are different ones. Yeah. And, uh, we're not saying yeah. that one is better than the other. Uh, just no. uh, some people work in better in certain environment. And I know my colleagues, some of them are actually missing the office uh, environment and they want to come back or they go every now and then because they have to do something. While the others are saying we are perfectly fine at home. It's proven that we can work from home. So why change it? So I think that working at home would be one of the major things that is about to stay for longer for many people or at least many companies uh, taking that decision. I know some companies were already having uh, that and um, something that there was like a flexible working space. Also, because when you look at the actually uh, bottom line, the, the less office space you have to have, the, the smaller your cost is really. Because real estate for many, uh, the office space is a, a huge um, cost for any company. So you can minimize that and turn it into benefits for, for your employees as well. Yeah. Martin, again. Based on the consultancy I've been doing, going digital can also involve incorporating digital elements in the relatively non-digital world like retail, rather than abandoning the traditional in favor of digital. Yeah, kind of a digital kind of approach. We yeah. have a, <clears throat> a mix of of both. I think there was a lot of omni-channel going on, you know, the companies that I have physical stores and, and online and how important it is to have both, etc., etc. also in uh, data, information, etc. I think those companies that were resistant to, to go digital because they were, again, traditional retailers, now my struggle. Yeah. Uh, because nobody, not many people go to the city center doing shopping, right? So certain retail definitely needs to move to the omni-channel. Not sure if completely digital. Uh, I do believe sometimes you do want to have the shop experience. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think would be the future for retail? Are we going solely digital soon? No, I don't. It, it's hard to say. Um... If you would have asked the question five years ago, would you do grocery online? Uh, you would say no. And uh, now we're getting a picnic uh, coming twice a week to our house. We started already two years ago, but uh, um, um, so yeah, I, I think it's very hard to predict um, what will be happening, uh, especially on that side. Um, I think that the impact of digital will grow, will get more convenience. Uh, we'll still get some physical um, experience uh, somewhere uh, and not necessarily as a um, as an experience thing. I mean, the shopping experience in Albertine or the Yumbo or the Plus is not a shopping experience. It's just you do your grocery. <laughs> if, we, if we're straight about it, I mean, we, so we, we, we can If anyone from Albertheim or Jumbo is on that session, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, the, the experience is okay, but I mean, it, I'm still going there for grocery. I'm not waking up on Saturday morning thinking, how oh, should I go to Jumbo today? No, I, I need to. Um, so, yeah, so uh, there, there's still a place for them, and there's some convenient aspect to that. So, if in the evening I need something, I have a plus supermarket close to my house, I can just go, jump out and I want to buy quickly something yeah. and I can go and I'm back in 10 minutes. So I think that convenience aspect uh, will be remaining. Mm -hmm. what, what, what do you think yourself? Well, um, as a female customer, um, <laughs> I do enjoy the uh, pleasure that I take in browsing through the shops, not even buying, but just being there. Uh, the beauty of touching a product and feeling it, I know a lot of people move to buying cosmetics, for example, or uh, clothing, uh, shoes online. I don't mind doing it, but you know, there are those two types of behaviors. So people that go to the shop, check it 
there and then go home and order online. And people that first go online, do the research and then go to the shop, right? So yeah. that's, that's the two types of behavior. And I think I do uh, mainly first one, I do my research online and then I go to the shop. So I already kind of shortlist what I'm interested in or where can I find the thing I want? And then I go to the shop. Sometimes I'm in the shop and I'm checking online whether the price online is better or can I get the similar thing somewhere else, et cetera, et cetera. Especially with the electronics or consumer goods, I mm -hmm. want to have a contact with also the salesperson to ask questions, uh, but I do check it online. Like I verify the story and I check the price as well. So I think that that retail part for me is still important. I could use um, maybe grocery uh, entirely online. This is not the, the shopping yeah. I'm talking about, but I'm shopping. I'm talking about the products like jewelry, uh, clothing, yeah. shoes, uh, uh, makeup. I found that um, bringing some kind of satisfaction uh, and doing it. Some people love it. Some people hate it. I love that experience. I still would love to have it. Yeah. yeah. That's important uh, for, for, for me, definitely. So um, I would love to retail to, to stay as an experience, as you said. Yeah. How about you? Do you shop? Do you do you like going shopping or you are rather the person that online buys it online? Zailando. No, no, I hate uh, online shopping for clothing. So um, um, I, I just go to a couple of stores that I go. I pick a lot of stuff. I put them in a bag. I go home, I test. Um, and when I find something that fits, then I order those products online. So I order from Zara or from other brands that I know, okay, this fits. And this is how I do it. So um, I'm, I'm not an avid shopper. Mm -hmm. um, Conscious of time, um, I think we can probably wrap up um, unless people have some extra questions and then we can go back to uh, the networking area or the expo. Right. Would you, does, do anyone in the room have some final questions they would like to ask to the chat? Thanks, thank Hans. you, ben. We We wanted to keep it more kind of open for everyone to, to step in, share their experience, have a little bit of engagement and uh, we spent some time with Sultan prepping for that presentation to have a conversation and we had different angles and approaches to, to our content. So we hope you enjoy that. And thank you for all of you that were on the chat and Mark that stepped in to, to be with us. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Yeah. So thanks everyone. Thanks, Yolita. Thank you. Too. And, uh, and uh, have a great evening, everyone. And uh, we can connect through LinkedIn or through um, any means and I uh, hope indeed Martin hope to see you guys and ladies live someday yeah thank you so much and let's join the networking to follow personally thank you so much okay. bye bye, bye, -bye.